Hey everybody, welcome back. This is Gregory Unruh and we are in video two of our five video series on geomimicry. In our, our last video, I introduced geomimicry, which is the human imitation of physical geological processes in the design and manufacture of products and services. And we argued that geomimicry has been the basis of human industry since prehistoric ancestor time and really has been the, the basis of our success uh, of our modern industrial world. So in this segment, though, we want to take a look at the challenges uh, and the pressing environmental problems that arise due to our dependence on geomimicry. And the most basic of these is our reliance on the extraction of natural resources that produces uh, generalized environmental degradation, you know, going after things like mining for mineral, minerals or drilling for oil or logging for lumber. All of these produce large scale surface disruptions. Uh, here you can see the tar sands, these, these dense, heavy hydrocarbons that are extracted in places like Canada. They provide a powerful example of environmental degradation. You go from a beautiful boreal forest to these denuded moonscapes uh, that extend over city-sized tracts of land. Uh, they're, they're incredible transformation of the surface that it comes, just, just extracting the, mat the materials we need for geomimicry. Mining is another source of these disturbances and the damage is often so extensive you can actually see it from space. And so just extracting these resources, cutting down a forest for, for, for lumber, all of these things cause large environmental degradation and disturbance. But then beyond the extraction, when we need to transform those materials through our geomimetic processes, we cause additional damage. That's because these industrial temperatures and pressures don't occur naturally on the surface of the planet, except at places like you know, volcanoes or perhaps plate boundaries. So biology is not adapted uh, and, and is unable to deal with it. And when things get really out of control, you can have catastrophic consequences from these geomimetic uh, industrial activities. Um, beyond catastrophic explosion, geomimicry relies on extracting these hazardous substances from the Earth's crust, and then they escape and get out into the environment. Uh, and on top of this, we're also creating synthetic substances that the biosphere is just not adapted to deal with. And so you have events like this is a river in northern China that was turned red by the dumping of industrial wastes. In the United States, where I'm recording this right now, we have Superfund sites, which are old industrial facilities that have been contaminated by the byproducts of geomimetic industry. There are over 1,300 active Superfund sites here in the United States, with more being added. And amazingly, over the 40 years since the Superfund law has been passed, only 300 of, the, of these sites, actually 375 to be exact, have been cleaned up and closed. So it's estimated that one in five citizens of the United States live within a five mile radius of a Superfund site. And a hundred of these are still not under control and so people are, are constantly still being uh, impacted and, and exposed to these contaminants. The bigger problem arises though when the geosphere meets the biosphere because bio biology doesn't know what to do with all of these ge geologic and synthetic materials. And what the body of a living organism tries to do is keep those toxins away from vital organisms by locking them up in fats. And this leads to something known as bioconcentration. You have, you, you have reservoirs of concentrated pollutants in the fat uh, deposits on, on, a, on the bodies of organisms. Now, to measure the extent of chemical con contamination, the Environmental Working Group, uh, uh, an activist group, tested what they thought would be pristine material, which, which was the blood of, of a newborn baby's umbilical cord. And to their surprise, over 200 industrial chemicals on average were found in, in, the, in the blood. And these included things like pesticides, uh, consumer product ingredients, and the wastes arising from the burning of coal, uh, coal and gas. Uh, and it wasn't limited to human babies. Synthetic synthetic chemicals are found nearly in every nearly in nearly every living thing on the planet, from Arctic seals to Antarctic penguins. Everywhere scientists look, they find these synthetic contaminants in the, in the in the fat deposits of animals. And of course, our mimicking of the planet's nuclear energy process has its own consequences. Obviously, the catastrophic release of atomic power is one of the most destructive forces on the planet. But the slow motion problem we have from this accumulation of depleted nuclear fuels is uh, an, ongoing, an ongoing problem that we 
After seven years since the first nuclear power went online, we have made almost no progress in dealing with. We haven't figured out to do what to do with all of that waste. And our solution has really been just to dig holes, dig big holes in the ground and put the waste in the ground. There are in the United States, there are over 70 of these sites. And, um, you know, nature, if you look in nature, nuclear isotopes are found in, on the surface, at least, in very low concentration, something that makes natural lithospheric radiation relatively harmless to humans and life in the biosphere. Um, but we instead are to concentrate these in these tombs full of nuclear waste. Um, and by doing that, implicitly, we are turning those materials back over to the geosphere to deal with them. And I think what might surprise many people is that the geosphere deals with them through the lithosphere's version of a circular economy. What we'll see in the next video is that we already have a functioning circular economy and that we are implicitly relying on that circular economy to recycle all of our wastes, which in the next video, we're going to see the challenges that arise from that. So I'll see you in the next video.